All right. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. We're going to get started in just a moment here, but a few housekeeping remarks before we get underway. We are recording this event, and the video will be available on the Basic Science website in a couple of weeks. So uh, if you want to watch the event again, or if you have friends, family, or colleagues who might be interested, um, please feel free to share. We are going to keep the audience muted throughout the event um, due to the high turnout. So um, you'll be muted throughout the event. We do want to hear from you, though. So if you have questions for any of our panelists today, please post them in the chat, and we will try to get to as many of them as we can. And uh, with that, it's my pleasure to introduce the Dean of Biological Sciences, Mike Butchen. Uh, good, e good afternoon, and welcome to Basic Science Lights the Way. I'm so delighted to join you again for another afternoon, evening, early evening of thought-provoking conversation. It's hard to believe that we already in the sixth season of this virtual series, something that began as a ne necessary pivot towards uh, during a tough time has become a uh, something uh, uh, unexpected and uplifting outcome of the pandemic. Uh, the community we have created it includes uh, academics, citizen scientists, and curious lifelong learners. Tonight's topic is repair and regeneration of the body. We'll hear from three faculty members from the Department of Molecular and Cell Biology about how repair and regeneration naturally occur in the human body. This is an increasingly important topic as humans are living longer than ever before and require new therapeutics and treatment for disease. Berkeley may not have a medical school, but we are a major player in the realm of biological sciences related to, among other things, uh, repair and the topic of, of tonight, repair and regeneration. This is made evident by our research breakthroughs regarding CRISPR genome editing, immuno-oncology, telomeres and telomerase, which we'll touch on this evening. Our students and faculty ask basic questions leading to answers that define our future. Our moderator tonight, uh, this afternoon is Richard Harlan. Richard is a senior associate dean of the biological sciences and is the C.H. Lee Distinguished Professor of Molecular and Cell Biology. Richard's research aims to understand the early developmental biology of vertebrate animals at the molecular level. He has made major research contributions to understanding the early embryo and the first steps in formation of the nervous system and the Speyman mangold organizer. Uh, Harland is a member of the uh, U.S. National Academy of Sciences, a former president of the Society for Developmental Biology, a Conklin medalist, and was elected a fellow of the Royal Society in London in 2019 for uh, substantial contributions for the improvement of natural language and knowledge. <laughs> Cut the language. I put language in there. Uh, uh, once we get underway, again, we encourage our guests to post their questions for our speakers in the chat box. Uh, while we won't get all to, to, the, all, to all the questions in this one hour, we'll answer as many as we can. And with that, Richard, the floor is all yours. Thank you, Mike. I'm excited to host tonight's event. This truly is a topic that currently does and certainly will affect everybody. As Mike said, we'll be hearing from three of my colleagues about their research on biological repair and regeneration. All living organisms, including all the wonderful people who have joined us this evening, have some natural ability to regenerate cells, tissues, or organs. You may have broken a bone when you were younger, or healed a cut, or simply let your hair grow longer. Some animals go far beyond our abilities to regrow lost limbs and organs. We'll be hearing some of that this evening. So how can we combine our observations in nature with the latest technological advances to better understand how the human body functions? And how can we use that knowledge to create life-changing remedies for a variety of conditions, injuries, and diseases? 
Our speakers are studying these questions from several promising angles, and I'm delighted to share them with you. At the end of each talk, we'll try to address all of the questions from the audience, so please add questions in the chat. And our first speaker is Assistant Professor Andrew Gomez. Uh, she's a, a professor of molecular and cell biology, a faculty affiliate of Helen Wills Neuroscience Institute. The Gomez Lab uses molecular biology, electrophysiology, and functional imaging to decode the cues that organize neural networks in the brain. They're primarily interested in understanding how cells and molecules in the brain enable flexibility and change, known as brain plasticity. To understand this brain plasticity better, she's studying the impact of psychedelic compounds, such as those found in psychedelic, psychedelic mushrooms. She's testing these on mice. If she can discover key molecules that allow psilocybin to boost brain plasticity, pharmaceutical compounds could be developed that increase plasticity in disease contexts. For her research, Gomez was awarded the 2021 Rose Hill Innovator Grant, and the 2023 Sloan Research Fellowship. So over to you, Andrea. All right, so Gwatsi, um, thank you for the introduction. So my first encounter with the medicinal use of psychedelics happened whenever I was 16. Uh, it was a nerdy encounter. I was at a summer workshop at uh, New Mexico State University called the Medicinal Plants of the Southwest, where I learned about the medicinal use of peyote. Now, fast forward to today, uh, myself and my team here at Berkeley focus on identifying and understanding the organizing principles of neuroplasticity encoded at the interface of gene regulation and RNA biology. Uh, we'd like to understand um, how gene regulation um, and our biology, RNA biology allow for circuits to build and allow for continued learning throughout life. Now these asterisks here indicate our long-term goal of using, using psychedelics as a discovery tool to reveal the molecular pathways that promote or limit plasticity um, with the long-term goal of developing next generation therapeutics to treat neurological and psychiatric disorders associated with defective plasticity. So here we have, what is the evidence of why psychedelics have made such an impact um, in current uh, clinical trials? So here is a clinical trial um, using uh, psilocybin, which is the psychoactive component in, in magic mushrooms, um, given to patients with a terminal cancer. Um, and what we can see here, what I want to demonstrate here on the top row is we see that at the start of the study, we see a downshift in the uh, scores of depression and anxiety levels um, that happen immediately and persist over the course of, uh, half, uh, of, a, of half a year. Um, likewise, the, the quality of life and death, death acceptance scores go up. Um, now, in this famous image from Giovanni Petri, using data from brain scans from individuals who received either a placebo or a dose of psilocybin, which is, again, the psychoactive component in magic mushrooms, paints you a picture that I did not need to convince you of, which is that a psychedelic trip can be profoundly mind-altering. But what about this constellation of elevated brain activity from a single dose can lead to not just immediate, but these long lasting enduring changes in neural network uh, and uh, neural function. So this leads uh, us to the kind of the focus and how my lab asks these questions. Um, we believe that there are plasticity responding uh, signals in our brain that will induce uh, some components for neural flexibility. Now we think that psychedelics like psilocybin robustly engage this information in the genome. So from this, we ask what can psychedelics teach us about neural plasticity and can we mimic that psychedelic induced plasticity in contexts like neurodegeneration? So the, the place that we look at this, um, we in the brain, we look at in the prefrontal cortex. So here we have some images um, showing the uh, human and the mouse prefrontal cortex. 
And in bold, I just want to pay you to pay attention that these are shared uh, cognitive functions between mice and humans. So like us, the prefrontal cortex in mice is critical for cognitive flexibility, social cognition, attention, visceral pain, social isolation. But most importantly, in this prefrontal cortex, we have enrichment of serotonergic axons and serotonergic receptors. And as some of, some of you may know that psychedelic um, bind to serotonergic receptors to mediate the psychedelic effects. So here um, on the right is a, a diagram of some critical cells in the prefrontal cortex that my lab is focusing on. And if we kind of consider um, what kind of features do they, they process, um, we know that the, you know, neurons, they, they fire action potentials and they excite each other, but they don't do so just uniformly. They, some of them excite, um, some of them function to inhibit. And what we know about this relationship between excitation and inhibition during development is that excitation dominates. And later as we age, um, inhibition comes online and inhibits the level of this excitation. Now, when we look at the, the response to psychedelics in these cell types, um, here is an, another view, is if we can see that components like the, the synaptic um, organizers, we can see elevation in these excitatory synaptic components. So here, a diagram on the right just demonstrates where some of these components lie at the connections between neurons. And we can see in here in gray that this is the overall levels that are increasing 48 hours, so two days after seeing a psychedelic exposure. Um, whereas if we look selectively in those neurons that are causing inhibition or preventing the, the spikes from occurring, we see that these synaptic components are, are going down. So what this tells us is that overall, the excitation onto these select neurons are overall reducing. Now, what does this mean in the context of plasticity? So here we are looking at, uh, again, this blowout of the circuit of the, of the prefrontal cortex. And what our current hypothesis is, is that in development where excitation dominates and inhibition lags behind, we believe that psychedelics are recapitulating or reanimating a developmental like state. Now, again, when the adult, this excitation inhibition gets balanced out, we think that we're kind of tipping the scale backward in time to allow for this the opening of a plasticity window. Um, and interestingly enough that we know that as we age, uh, not only does our ability for plasticity uh, decline, um, but this is associated with the maturation um, of these inhibitory neurons. So what we think we are doing in a psychedelic experience or exposure to a psychedelic compounds is that we're returning back time, at least molecularly defined in these PB or inhibitory neurons. So moving forward, what uh, the goal of our lab is to try and develop is these, these molecular pathways um, that are reminiscent of development that are also engaged by psychedelics, can we target them selectively to open plasticity windows in contexts where psychedelics are may not have the most efficiency, uh, such as uh, what occurs during neurodegeneration. So I just want to have a, a trigger warning. The next uh, set of slides may have some flashes. Um, so this is kind of the outlook of the what my lab is doing. As I mentioned, we're interesting, interested in identifying the molecular pathways that are engaged by psychedelics. We then will in, adapt uh, CRISPR technologies to selectively target these genes, or rather the RNAs encoded by these genes, and wield them in context where we have neurodegeneration or, or trauma. 
Um, but this is one set of projects um, in parallel to many other projects that are ongoing in my lab, um, like the nervous system in our, in our brain. Um, we also have a 500 million neurons that line our entire digestive tract. Um, and here is a small little piece of small intestine of the mouse where we express a fluorescent uh, encoder that will flash whenever it sees excitation. And what you're seeing here is a small intestine responding to psilocybin. So in other words, we are visualizing what it looks like if our gut is tripping. Now, this uh, we are also looking at in specific input specific processing um, and other in other regions of the brain, and we're also looking at splice codes um, in the brain and the gut. Or other words, we're looking at organizing functions in the brain and the gut. So with that, um, I would just like to give a shout out to my lab. Um, uh, I love this photo. Uh, this actually was a photo um, taken by the photographer the exact moment that our couch broke. Um, and I'd like to pay a, a special um, acknowledgement to Michael Xiao, my PhD student who um, work I displayed today. And with that, I'd be happy to take any questions. Thanks very much, Andrea. Great stuff. Um, let's see, I'm going to ask a question first about the, uh, the relationship between the psychedelics and antidepressants. Uh, so both of them apparently work through serotonin. So uh, since one of my favorite daily regimens is taking my antidepressant, <laughs> I wonder how this effect, how this is similar or different from the psilocybin effects. Yeah, so most uh, serotonergic um, uh, targeting compounds like SSRIs, are, uh, which is most common in, in most antidepressants. Um, the, the main point is, I think, is the, the lag time. So antidepressants take about 30 days to have their effect. It's not exactly clear why um, the, the effect is, it takes so long. But I think what can be appreciated by the um, by psychedelic activity of, of serotonergic signaling is it happens very robustly. Now, SSRIs stand for serotonergic reuptake inhibitor, so it's uh, acting slightly different. It's preventing the neurotransmitter from um, being uh, reuptake to the, to the synapse, whereas psychedelics are directly acting on the serotonergic uh, cells. Uh, are expressing cells, um, but also notably, SSRIs don't give us a psychedelic trip. So the uh, robustness of the signaling, I would say, um, we think is is just more uh, is is higher uh, in in activity compared to SSRIs. Thank you. Uh, another question from the chat here: Have you compared the effects to? to uh, ketamine, which may be very similar, I suppose, in action. Yeah, ketamine, so ketamine acts on NMDA receptors, so not directly uh, serotonin receptors, but it does produce some uh, kind of hallucinatory psychedelic-like effects. Um, this is uh, unpublished, but some work from John Hopkins from Gould Dolan's lab suggests, I mean, so a ketamine uh, trip can last about 30 minutes, whereas a psilocybin trip can last six hours, LSD can last 12, uh, 12 hours, and ibogaine, um, which is the psychoactive component in uh, iboga, can last anywhere from 24 to, to 72 hours, which suggests that this length of time um, that is activating the serotonergic receptors or the signaling pathways um, corresponds to the, the magnitude of, of plasticity that's engaged. So in other words, uh, ketamine uh, trips, you know, if you are undergoing ketamine treatment for depression, you have to um, go back every two weeks, whereas current clinical data from psilocybin trials suggests that they can last, you know, six months um, even and even beyond. So those are some key differences between ketamine and, and these other, uh, what we call classic psychedelics. And let's uh, combine a couple of questions. Um, let's see, this is jumping around. So, uh, yeah, so in, in terms of the gastrointestinal applications, are there any clear uh, applications? And in particular, uh, Matthew Ludwig asks, any work on psilocybin on irritable bowel syndrome? 
Well, that is actually our, our goal, my lab's goal. So uh, 95% of all serotonin in our body actually resides in the gut. These are ancient signaling systems and our gut um, you know, uses serotonin, serotonin signaling for its motility as we saw. Um, we think likewise compared to the, to the brain that our gut nervous system has the capacity for plasticity. Um, and we anticipate that in conditions like irritable bowel syndrome um, or other gastrointestinal dysfunction uh, also probably will affect the, the nervous system. So can we develop next generation therapeutics um, that directly target the, the gastrointestinal um, function of, the, of, um, of gut health? Have some real specialists in the audience here. So we've got one. Ed, Edwin Ching is asking, how reproducible are these effects between individual subjects? Uh, uh, in regarding the clinical trials, so I would let's, let's there, go with that. Yeah. So there have so right now, if you look up uh, tr clinicaltrials.gov, you can see that there's hundreds of clinical trials to treat anything from depression, anxiety disorder, alcohol use disorder. Um, but I think the evidence that is the strongest for the um, reproducibility is a thousand years of indigenous use of these compounds of ceremonial use. Terrific. Um, so let's see. Uh, there's a question from Danielle about whether, well, since serotonin also interacts with melatonin, are there any circadian differences from taking psilocybin? Oh, good question. Um, so I don't know specifically about circadian cycle, but the one cycle that I do know that um, psilocybin has, or psychedelics have been anecdotally known to affect is actually the menstrual cycle. There have been multiple reports of people saying that if they have had um, kind of disrupted cycle, that it can kind of kick it back online. Um, so the, um, yeah, the circadian rhythm, I, I, I am not quite sure. And so now you're using psilocybin, but uh, what about other compounds? Are they equally interesting? I think, indeed, I think they're equally interesting. Some of the reasons for using psilocybin is um, in part because if we think that we would like to adapt these medicines um, for, for broader public use, um, thinking about running a trial for a, a 12 or 24 hour psychedelic trip is a lot more expensive than a six hour trip for psilocybin. Um, so those are just some of the practical reasons. But I think, you know, in, indeed, you know, there are hundreds of psychedelic compounds known. So um, the, I think we're just kind of at the very beginning of exploring like how uh, robustly or, you know, how differently do these compounds engage our, our genes encoding um, plasticity? Well, time's up, but uh, I can't resist asking uh, Rick Reader's question, which is, should we all be taking psilocybin? <laughs> so... I rec so we have so I just want to just note you know I'm not trying to proselytize the use of, of, of psychedelics it's a medicine and there are known risks um, some of these risks are are made available on the Berkeley Center for the Science of Psychedelics website which of which I'm a member of here at Berkeley um, I think that. I think we should treat the medicine respect like we treat all other medicines with respect and know that um, there are, the, I guess the, do, the medicine is in the dose. Um, context uh, is, is critical. We know certain individuals uh, are susceptible um, to some negative effects of, of, these, of these compounds. So I think, um, yeah, uh, being educated and also understanding mechanistically, which is what my lab hopes to do, will help kind of alleviate some of the um, of the of the risks and potentially identify biomarkers um, for for individuals who may uh, be susceptible for some of these negative effects. Well, thank you, Andrew. That was fascinating. Uh, I think that we'll be you'll be able to answer some of the other questions in the chat. I forget how that works, but. Uh, uh, moving on immediately to our next speaker, who uh, I'm pleased to say is Dirk Hockemeyer. Uh, the focus of Associate Professor Dirk Hockemeyer's work is to establish reliable models of human disease using genetically engineered human and uh, mouse stem cells 
and, and screening those genomes for important functions. He's particularly interested in developing a really rigorous genetic approach to study human diseases, as well as their development in cell biology, where conventional animal models or tissue culture systems do not adequately recapitulate the human biology. To do this, his lab uses his amazing expertise in human stem cell techniques, combined with the house method, genome editing, and humanized mouse models to understand human stem cell renewal and also its differentiation and, and problems in disease. So Derek, please uh, go ahead and tell us your, about your work. Uh, thank you, Richard, for this kind introduction. I, I would like to tell you one story that I find particularly interesting that applies stem cells to study um, a very specific disease that, that I am very passionate about. And um, it has to do with the fundamental function of stem cells um, to regenerate the human body. Stem cells have this unique function to generate themselves, which we refer to as self-renewal, but then they also have the ability to differentiate, meaning that they can become a new type of cell that we refer to as somatic cell that makes the large part of our body. Uh, most of our functioning cells that, that execute the functions of, of our body um, are what we refer to as terminally differentiated. And a key feature of these somatic cells is that they have a limited lifespan. They have a limited proliferative capacity. And that is because there is a fundamental principle that these uh, distinguishes stem cells and somatic cells, and that is that they have a molecular clock. Um, this molecular clock ensures that somatic cells are restricted in their proliferation. And if this aspect of the clock breaks, then cells that normally would stop dividing in our body can progress and become cancerous. On the other, on the other hand, cells that are in our body, stem cells, that are required to regenerate our tissue for many, many years, 80 to 100 years, need to ensure that they have the continuous ability to self-renew. And if this aspect of the molecular clock breaks, then usually tissues can run out of capacity prematurely, and that leads to tissue failure syndromes or aging syndromes. The fundamental concept of this clock is what I would like to talk to you today about, um, because some aspects of this are really relevant to human disease. Okay, the, the, the hardwiring of this molecular principles that cells know how old they are is hardwired in the end of every of our chromosomes. Our chromosomes have a repetitive sequence that is referred to as the telomere, that is sequence that is in, in itself not encoding information, but it functions as a buffer sequence that when the chromosome end shortens as a consequence of continuous DNA replication, these repeats will shorten over time unless an enzyme that is referred to as telomerase can regenerate these repeats. By the way, this enzyme was discovered here at UC Berkeley and was um, uh, awarded with the Nobel Prize to Carol Greider and Liz Blackburn in the MCB department at UC Berkeley. Um, if this enzyme um, is active, it can replenish the repetitive sequences of the chromosome. This, this counting of the repeats at the chromosome end, I will introduce to you as the, as the way that cells count. I just want to point out that there is a protein complex that can specifically bind to this chromosome ends that, that is present at every of our chromosomes. I introduced to you the fundamental principle between stem cells and somatic cells. So the way that they count is that stem cells constitutively express the enzyme telomerase. So telomere length over time stays constant. In somatic cells, however, since telomerase is not expressed, the repetitive sequences will continuously shorten, leading to um, the progressive loss of repetitive sequence. We can monitor this by something that we call a southern blot, where we just probe genomic DNA that we isolate from cells. And what you can appreciate in this little uh, smear here is 
that the numbers go down progressively with population doublings in human fibroblasts, which are um, human somatic cells. When telomeres get short, and I'm just going to point you at this, um, this number of about four kilobases of repetitive sequence at the chromosome end, on average, cells will enter a state that is referred to as replicative senescence. This is a viable cell state, but cells will not continuously divide. This functions as a tumor suppressor mechanism because in these cells, um, telomeres are short, and only if cells reestablish telomerase expression, which happens in tumor cells through the reactivation of telomerase, telomeres will, mean, will remain stable over time and cells can continuously proliferate. It's a key feature of human tumor cells. The physiological implementation of this principle of the molecular clock, if we plot the telomere length now in lymphocytes that are isolated from the human body, I'm going to direct your attention here to the 50th percentile of the human population. We draw blood and we ask, how long are your telomeres? Initially, we are born with relatively lo short, uh, long telomeres. However, they will progressively shorten with age. So what is the physiological relevance of, of this particular behavior becomes quite evident if you look at patients that present in the clinic with bone marrow failure syndrome. And that can be seen here. Every of this red dot is a patient that presents in the clinic with critically short bone marrow, actually bone marrow failure. And what you can appreciate is that they have age inappropriately short telomeres. And um, this, is, this, is a, this is a genetic disease. Um, and it's actually fatal if the, if the patient doesn't get a bone marrow transplant, then this, uh, this will lead to, to um, death. So I got very interested and my lab got very interested in one particular um, uh, manifestation of this disease, which is when um, one of the proteins that can bind to the repetitive sequences, to the repetitive sequence in the telomere um, is mutated. And this is um, this protein TIN2. This is a particularly interesting mutation because it is found in a, what we refer to a heterozygous setting, which means that only one copy of the gene being mutated is already sufficient to elicit the disease. And it, el it elicits a very severe form of this disease. Usually young kids present with this. Um, and again, if they don't find a donor, then uh, this is a fatal disease. So um, the mutations that lead to this disease always occur in one specifically as part of the protein that we refer to as the DC cluster. But the key point is that it's heterozygous. So we decided to study this in the context of human pluripotent stem cells. This is our model system of choice. And we used CRISPR-Cas9, again, a Nobel Prize at UC Berkeley for Jennifer Doudner, um, the technology that allows you to introduce any mutation um, in, in this case into human pluripotent stem cells. And we en engineered cells to carry this mutation. And we just asked the simple question, do human embryonic stem cells with this mutation recapitulate the critically short phenotype of these cells? And they do. Here's the same blot that I showed you earlier. Here I have three samples of wild type cells that don't carry the mutation. They have normal telomere length. However, if we introduce the mutation just on one copy, telomeres are apparently short. And you can appreciate that the average smear of telomeres in this sample here is shorter. Now we ask the very simple question, since these mutations are heterozygous, is this a mutation that is dominant? So we again use Cas9 to cut out the mutation and convert a cell that, excuse me, that carried this mutation into a mutation that just had a non-functional copy of this gene. And we found a very surprising result. This is the starting telomere length of the heterozygous cell line, which again has very short telomeres, 4 kV. However, if we convert this and cut out the mutant telomeres reset to a normal length, this is actually really exciting because it formally proves genetically that it is a dominant mutation. And it poses the question, 
is this a clinical intervention? Is this a strategy that could be used as a clinical intervention strategy? Because we pose the, we pose the idea that if you can isolate the bone marrow from a kid that has this dominant mutation, the only thing that we wouldn't need, the only thing, I'm gonna step back here. What one could envision to do here is one could disrupt this uh, dominant allele and turn it into a non-functional allele in vitro, in vitro, and then re-engraft the kid its own bone marrow to reconstitute functional cell system. So towards establishing such a, such a system, we collaborated uh, with a clinician at Baylor who actually sees these kids. This is this are samples from, from kids that are um, currently with, with very, very short telomeres and have critical bone marrow. We got very small samples of bone marrow from these kids, and we're currently testing the, the hypothesis is that we can disrupt this dominant allele and hopefully thereby reestablish telomere maintenance. Here, I just show you on this right graph that the experiments that were successful so far in human uh, uh, pluripotent stem cells, so the system that we used in vitro, can actually also work in human hematopoietic cells. So towards a clinical translation of our basic biological finding, we're actually one step towards pushing this into um, a potential clinical application. And with that, I'm going to finish on uh, just showing the people in my lab that uh, did this work. Uh, most of the work that I've shown you uh, was done uh, by my very talented Sarah Chu, who currently um, does postdoctoral training actually in um, a clinically in a lab that that uh, that tries to do clinical translational research. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, thanks very much, Derek. That was uh, terrific stuff. And uh, let me lob you an easy question first. So uh, you are cutting out the whole mutant gene, essentially. Why don't you use fancy CRISPR technology to simply repair it back to the wild type form? Yeah, so that, that is an easy one. Um, cutting and destroying is always easier than making a designer mutation. And so... Um, we are actually exploring currently many ways to disrupt this dominant or corrupted allele. And by just cutting, we have many, many choices where to do this. And so just by having met several strategies to disrupt the gene, we can optimize better for efficiency. We can optimize better for, um, for off-target effects that may be unwanted uh, effects of the, of the Cas9 editing strategy. So it is just more versatile. Also, we would need to regenerate a reagent for every single mutation. The, the, the kids don't have all the same mutation. A generalizable null strategy would be, a clip, be applicable for actually many, uh, for, for almost all TIN2 patient kids. Thank you. Let me ask a question from Warren Gish, who I've not seen since he graduated uh, from Mike Botchin's lab uh, before Stanley Hall. The old Stanley Hall was destroyed. So Warren asks, so the telomere is restored? Ha, that's a very shock good question. There. Yeah, so we do not know that yet. So I, I try to be quite careful when I said where we are in this research. Um, in our in vitro model system, telomeres are restored. In the, in the kids' patient cells, we do not have the answer. And this is not because we, we, we it's, it's the limitation is um, the amount of material that we need to test this. And so that also is the, is the key limitation of, um, that we are currently facing. Um, some, a kid that presents with bone marrow failure to take bone marrow from that kid to develop this strategy, these are very precious samples. And these cells are already very sick. So I think currently, if I had to, if I, I do not know the answer. Now, um, we will find the answer and we have very, uh, very clear strategies of how to find the answer, but I can't, I can't say uh, this is the magic bullet, but it's definitely worth pursuing. Let me say one last thing, even stabilizing the telomeres in these cells will already benefit these kids quite substantially. And there is strong selective pressure on the cells that actually 
um, have an effect because the cells that are not additive or that do not elongate the telomeres will, will disappear. So we think that there is really a therapeutic window. Thanks. Um, another question. Uh, what influence do telomeres have on aging in humans? And I think you showed the picture of the correlation yeah, of I, the I, bone marrow. I love value. that question. I love that question. And 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 I, I need to be careful that I that I don't get overly excited here. If you remember the graph where, where there are short telomeres present in very young kids, if you extrapolate from that telomere length out, you you at some point hit the 25th percentile of the 80-year-old. So we know for sure that it's a pathogenic state in those kids and it's driven by telomere length. So that, that really poses the question, what happens in age? And I think it's a smoking gun. Um, we, are, we are actively pursuing that. Um, but again, I need to be a little bit hand wavy because it needs very rigorous experimentation before you are really allowed to extrapolate from a cell that is present in a young to somebody that is in the 80 year old but it's a very keen it's a very good question and and i i this is this is what our lab tries to solve that's a great for a final question thanks very much derek I, i'm getting the orders from the boss to move on here okay uh, so our final speaker is megan martik megan if the floor is yours Oh, actually, before you start, I have to give the formal introduction. I'm sorry. <laughs> Megan Martix, an assistant professor. No, no introduction uh, needed. I'm like Madonna. Just call me Megan. <laughs> and uh, she is in the Department of Molecular and Cell Biology. And her team, as you'll find out, is focusing on understanding the regulation of uh, transcription that controls development of the neural crest that you'll learn about. Uh, how these networks are used in repair and how these networks go wrong in disease. So uh, she's fascinated by this regulatory logic and uh, Megan, take it away. Thank you, Richard. Um, hi everybody, uh, my name is Megan, as Richard said, and I'm an assistant professor. Uh, my lab's been open about a year in the Department of Molecular and Cell Biology. And today I'm gonna tell you uh, one story from our lab that I'm really excited about. And it's how we can hijack mechanisms that we uncover in regenerative organisms um, in order to understand how we can repair adult human tissues. And these programs are often uh, just a recapitulation of early embryonic development, which is another focus of my lab. And so today I'm gonna to tell you one story about how we can uh, make and mend the vertebrate heart using a population of stem cells found early in the embryo called the neural crest. And what you see here on my title slide is a regenerating zebrafish heart, which I hope by the end of this presentation, you have a, a newfound love for and appreciation for. So like I said, uh, the premise of this talk is learning how we can hijack information gained from regenerative animals to repair an adult human injury. And so why should we care about repairing an adult human heart? Um, it should go without, Explanation, the heart disease and heart attack are the leading causes of death, the leading causes of death in the United States. And even if patients survive a heart attack, uh, they're often left with an irreplaceable scar um, and a poorly functioning heart for the remainder of their life. And so our lab's focus is trying to understand how we can harness this regenerative ability of other organisms in order to replace and repair adult human heart tissue in instances of injury such as a heart attack. And so how can we repair a human heart? For that, we have to turn to organisms that can repair their hearts to uncover how nature's kind of already configured how this, how this process can work. So there are regenerative organisms such as zebrafish and axolotls that can completely regenerate uh, many organs including their hearts, whereas adult humans and adult mice are unable to regenerate their hearts. So to understand how cardiac regeneration after injury um, works, my lab has turned to the zebrafish, which offers a, a, a multitude of different um, tool sets for us to begin di dissecting how this process works on a molecular level but also offers a great model system um, for ease of housing, ease of accessibility. Uh, their embryonic development is rapid and transparent so we can visualize these processes in great detail using microscopy. 
And also they're really extremely quick to regenerate. Um, so it allows us to get to these questions really rapidly in this really um, unique model. So how does the zebrafish regenerate its heart? To just kind of walk you through a daily experiment in my lab, um, we take adult zebrafish um, and under a microscope, we can use fine dissection tools to open their chest cavity. Um, they clot really easily, so no sutures are needed, which is an also, also a fantastic reason for using zebrafish as a model to understand this process. But we can take tiny scissors and uh, injure their heart by dissecting off or resecting 20% of their adult ventricle. And so this is the adult ventricle in this illustration here. And after injury, nearly instantaneously, they'll form a clot and a transient scar that's composed of fibrin and collagen, similar to that you'd find in a human heart after a heart attack. But what's remarkable is that over the course of the next several weeks, this heart and all the heart cells within the heart will begin to divide. And after roughly 30 days, this is a completely repaired, fully functional, physiologically distinct, indistinct from um, an uninjured heart. And so they've undergone a complete regeneration. So to begin to understand how this heart regenerates, we first need to know what cells in the heart are responsible for this repair. The heart is composed of many different cell types, and especially after an injury, there's many different processes such as immune responses that are ignited in order to, um, to uh, respond to an injury. So what cells are responsible for the repair? Again, using zebrafish as a powerful model, we can use genetic lineage labeling approaches such as Crelox to um, molecularly label with fluorescent proteins different cell populations in the heart. And so what you see here is an adult zebrafish heart. This is the ventricle here and the atrium here. And what we've labeled in this particular experiment in magenta are a population of cells in the early embryo called the neural crest. And so these neural crest cells here are labeling a subset of the muscle cells in the heart and we refer to those as the neural crest muscle cells. And so what you see after injury is that this population of cells selectively responds to this injury and begins to expand around that wound. And it's these cells then that are responding um, and potentially uh, being given to us the idea that they could be required for regeneration. So how do we test that? So just to illustrate real quick um, what I just showed you, uh, the neural crest muscle cells comprise uh, roughly 12 to 15% of the total muscle cells of the heart. They're a very small percentage, but they're derived from the stem cell population early in development. And after injury, they're preferentially responding by expanding around this wound edge. But they might just be responding, are they required? And so again, we can turn to our genetic toolkit of the zebrafish, uh, where we can genetically ablate these neural crest muscle cells and see if they're still able to regenerate. So as a readout for successful regeneration, we can use a scarring assay where we actually stain for that fibrin collagen based scar after what should be successful regeneration. So with neural crest cells intact, we see here that this apex of this ventricle has been injured, has been able to completely regenerate. But after removal of the neural crest from the system, these cells um, are unable to regenerate, and there is a large scar that is harbored, uh, harbored in that apex uh, where the injury took place. So the next question we had was, how is this molecularly controlled? How do these cells know to respond to injury? So we take a two-pronged approach. Um, we've heard a lot about in the previous talks how development and adult repair um, are often um, just recapitulations or different processes, but are able to be indistinguishable on a molecular level. Um, and so what we do is we look at embryonic development to learn how these muscle cells are able to form in the embryo, but then how these muscle cells, learn about how these muscle cells are able to form new muscle cells after injury. Um, in addition to understanding a lot about regeneration from embryonic development studies, we can understand a lot about development from regeneration studies as well. And what you see here is the neural crest developing into the uh, larval heart, which is in green here. And again, this regenerating adult heart. So my lab takes a, a multi-angled uh, approach using genomics and CRISPR-Cas9, um, as well as epigenetic profiling to uncover genetic networks that are responsible for driving this process. And this might look like a hairball of, of different genes. And you can think of this as like a, a circuit board or a subway 
um, map of directions to get to an endpoint, which is heart muscle differentiation. But what I want you to appreciate is that this is an actual modular uh, description of what's happening, and you can dissect out different distinct subcircuits of different genes that drive processes such as heart muscle formation. And so this is one circuit, um, uh, for example, where we've tested that if you ablate these processes or these genes in the adult or in the embryonic heart, they are not able to form neural crest heart muscle. And so does this program control regeneration? And just in short, um, what we found is that this circuit is indeed reactivated after injury. And so we believe this circuit is also responsible for allowing these neural crest cells to make new heart muscle after injury. So a question I always get is, do mammals have neural crest heart muscle and is that why we can't regenerate? And the short of it is no, uh, we do have heart muscle that's derived from the neural crest as do mice and chicken and other non-regenerative organisms. And so that leads us to believe that uh, it's actually the genetic programs that aren't able to be reactivated. Um, and that's why we don't have the ability to drive repair. And so now my lab is beginning to look at how we can reprogram neural crest in mammals and human derived cell culture in order to drive repair. And so to do that, we've turned to human-derived organoid cultures of um, uh, what we call cardioids, which are cardiac-derived uh, organoids um, that can form chamber-like structures like a heart and begin to beat. Also, um, what's really important about them is you can injure them in vitro and allow a scar to form. So they physiologically will respond as if it's having a heart attack. Um, and so now what we can do is go in and reprogram these different cardioid models with our circuit, our regenerative circuit that we found in zebrafish to see if we can um, resolve this scar after injury. But the big goal is, are we able to harness this regenerative capacity of the neural crests such that we can drive an injury response in human hearts and beyond? And with that, I'd like to thank my lab and funding sources, and I'd love to take any questions. Okay, so some questions from the audience. We've got. Uh... Um, any thoughts why we've evolved away from regenerative capabilities or never evolved towards it? Yeah, no, that's a fantastic question. And one we think a lot about in the lab because we also study uh, species of fish where one population has actually lost their ability to regenerate and the other has retained it. And so we can study this loss of regenerative ability really closely um, with this population of, of animals. And uh, so we think about this question a lot, and I think my hypothesis is that we have developed other complex biological processes where this has now uh, been lost so that these other processes can be um, taken on. So kind of a compensation of sorts, but we might have just lost the ability because we haven't had the need to regenerate our hearts, such as other organisms that maybe have a more... Um, intense environment where their injury uh, to their heart is more uh, common. Uh, another question, can neural crest cells regenerate other organs in zebrafish besides the heart? Yeah, that's also a fantastic question. The zebrafish is highly regenerative. Um, it, they can regenerate their spinal cord, they can regenerate their fins, their, their brains, their jaws. And something I didn't get to get into is that the neural crest actually contributes to all of these organs. And so um, one thing that we're also looking at is just that, are, are the neural crest able to respond to injury in of, other, of other organs? I can say that um, other labs have looked at neural crest contribution to jaw regeneration. So the zebrafish can regenerate their jaw and that is a neural crest controlled process. Um, mice can regenerate their digit tips. So if you were to cut off a mouse finger, it can regenerate up to a certain point, And that is also a neural crest derived phenomenon. So um, the answer is, I believe that neural crest has a, a much greater role than we previously have known to drive regeneration in adult structures. And I'm hoping that we can uncover that. Lots of questions coming in. Uh, Warren Gish again may ask, maybe I missed it, but is zebrafish regeneration using the same pathways as used in normal development? Yes. So I showed just one small subcircuit of our greater gene regulatory network. Um, 
But on the whole, it's remarkably similar. There are, uh, we've taken a whole genome-wide approach at looking at both development and regeneration, which I unfortunately could not get into, um, but they're remarkably similar both in signaling pathways and transcriptional networks. Um, uh, but there are still distinct regeneration specific circuits, um, which we're trying to figure out what they do, but um, I, we believe that they're more involved in the immune response to the injury. Another question, you showed, I think, 20-25% uh, resection of the heart. In terms of cardiac damage, is there a limit in how much is repairable? Yeah, so... Um, the resection model is just one model that we use. We resect up to 20% just to keep it consistent. Uh, another model for injury is a genetic ablation system where you can ablate up to 60% of the muscle cells of the heart and um, they'll completely regenerate. And so uh, that's, I think the limitation I would say is the 60% of the total muscle cells that they can completely regenerate. Um, but what I would like to say too to that is that the neural crest muscle cells only represent 12 to 15% of the total muscle cells. But if you ablate just that 12 to 15%, they cannot regenerate. But if you ablate 60% of any of the muscle cells, they will. So um, yes, yeah, so the, the limitation to the resection is that they can bleed out if you cut away too much. So that's where we limit the 20%. What is your favorite idea for why there's such a difference between the regenerative model and us? Yeah, I think this is some kind of molecular switch. I think, you know, we have the cells that are there in the heart, ready, primed, ready to respond to injury, um, and they just can't do it. Uh, so I think it, it's some kind of... Um, epigenetic signal or cue that is repressing this activation of these responsive circuits that we're uncovering in zebrafish. And I think an easy way to test that is gonna be doing um, our 3D uh, human-derived cardioid modeling. Well, thanks very much, Megan. Thank you, Andrea, Derek, and Megan for sharing your wonderful work with us. Uh, I never lose my interest in the amazing biology that's going on here. Uh, let's see, we have a few more questions from the audience. Uh, let's see, I close the conversation. Oh, yes, yeah, so we got some more general questions here. And so, uh, so for all three participants, how do students, both graduate and undergraduate, contribute to your lab's research? So let's start with uh, Andrea, if we can. Yeah, well, I mean, the the our you know our training program is you know designed to precisely train the students to to develop the work. So, um, all the work that you saw today was actually experiments done by by uh, a student or our postdocs. It, the, they're absolutely critical for uh, mediating the work. Thank you, Andrea, and uh, Derek's turn. What's the biggest surprise or unexpected discovery you've encountered in your work? And you'll need to unmute. I don't know where to start. I mean, there's a surprise every day. Um, what happened yesterday? Yesterday. Um, in, oh, so I do not know. This is, I'm sorry that, that I'm, fumbling this so horribly. Um, every day is new and it is exciting that um, my job has new facets every day. That's best as this is how I can say it. I mean, the, if it if we knew it would be repetitive, then it wouldn't be called research. Sorry that I'm just going to say it like that. This is, this is the exciting part of you don't know what tomorrow brings. Thanks, Dirk. And this one I know uh, Megan's thought about. Uh, what what do you envision for improvements in tissue repair or regeneration within the next 10 years? Yeah, so I think, uh, you know, my lab and, and other labs are uncovering the switches that drive repair in regenerative organisms. And I think that it all boils down to finding these switches and having a, a deliverable CRISPR therapeutic 
um, that would, I see, be the limitation to making this a really translatable technology. Um, as soon as we're able to model these things in human-derived cell culture, I don't see any, any hold up besides having a very specific deliverable therapeutic um, to driving these regenerative processes in a human context. Thank you, Megan. So now I'm going to pass it back to uh, Mike Botchen. Mike, it's all yours. Okay. Well, in the next minute, I just want to thank uh, both the audience for joining us. And I encourage you to reach out if you'd like to learn more. And uh, the speakers are certainly going to be willing to engage you in those conversations. And we're, we're sharing additional resources with you by email. Uh, there'll be a video and a basic science lights the way website will be uh, available in about a week. And uh, I look forward to uh, uh, seeing you at the next event, uh, which is May 8th, where we'll discuss great events in evolution. That should be big. And uh, I'll, I'll end by just thanking all of our uh, faculty who presented really amazing research and obviously their enthusiasm. Uh, they could have gone on for another half hour at least. And Richard, uh, you were a perfect moderator. But uh, until the next time, uh, fiat lux and go bears. <laughs>